Well, Dr. Dawkins, uh, in American baseball, we say three strikes and you're out. But let me give you a bonus swing. Let's talk finally about the famous ontological argument. The version I'll present comes from the American philosopher Alvin Plantinga. By the way, did you know that uh, Plantinga would like to debate you? Yes, I, I'm serious, he told me so. Would you be willing to take him on? Yes, he is a philosopher. Well, okay, if you change your mind, he's ready and waiting. Plantinga's version of the ontological argument is formulated in terms of possible worlds. Now, for those in our audience who aren't familiar with the language of possible worlds, let me explain that by a possible world, I don't mean a planet or even a universe or any concrete reality. Rather, I simply mean a complete description of reality, a way reality might be. To say that God exists in some possible world is to say that there's a possible description of reality that could be true that includes the statement, God exists, as part of that description. Now, in his version of the ontological argument, Plantinga conceives of God as the greatest conceivable being, a maximally great being. So, what would such a being be like? Well, he would be all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, and he would exist in every logically possible world. A being which lacked any of those properties would not be maximally great. We could conceive of something greater. But what that implies is that if God's existence is even possible, then it follows logically that God must exist. For if a maximally great being exists in any possible world, it exists in all of them. That's part of what it means to be maximally great, to be all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good in every possible world. So if God's existence is even possible, he exists in every logically possible world, and therefore in the actual world. We can summarize this argument as follows. One, it's possible that a maximally great being, a.k.a. God, exists. Two, if it's possible that a maximally great being exists, then a maximally great being exists in every possible world. Three, if a maximally great being exists in every possible world, then it exists, uh, or rather in some possible world, then it exists in every possible world. Four, if a maximally great being exists in every possible world, then it exists in the actual world. Five, if a maximally great being exists in the actual world, then a maximally great being exists. Six, therefore, a maximally great being exists. Now, it might surprise you to learn that premises two to six of this argument are relatively uncontroversial. Most philosophers would agree that if God's existence is even possible, then it follows logically that God must exist. The principal issue to be settled with respect to planting his ontological argument is premise one. It's possible that a maximally great being exists. The atheist has got to say that it's impossible that God exists. You've got to say that the concept of God is incoherent, uh, like the concept of a married bachelor or a round square. But the problem is that the concept of God just doesn't appear to be incoherent in that way. The idea of a being which is all-powerful, all-good, all-knowing in every logically possible world seems to be perfectly coherent. Oh, so you think you can formulate a parody of the ontological argument to prove that God does not exist. Okay, let's hear it. Uh-huh. And so the, the claim is that a God who created everything while not existing is greater than a being who exists and created everything. Oh, Richard, Richard, Richard. 
Your argument doesn't undermine the ontological argument, it actually reinforces it. For the idea of a being which creates everything while not existing is logically impossible. There is no possible world in which there exists a non-existent being who creates the world. Now, if the atheist is to maintain, as he must, that the concept of God is similarly impossible, then the concept of God would have to be incoherent in that way. But the problem is, it's not. And that supports the plausibility of premise one. You did. And how did the philosophers and theologians at that conference react to your objection? They had to resort to modal logic to refute your objection. Dr. Dawkins, this is just embarrassing. The ontological argument just is an exercise in modal logic, the logic of the possible and the necessary. I can just imagine what a spectacle you must have made of yourself at that conference. <laughs> oh, you've got to go home now. Okay, go ahead. Thanks for joining us. Say, say hello to John Lennox for me. Boy, I guess that's what happens when someone starts pontificating about things he just doesn't understand. A man's got to know his limitations. <laughs>